and welcome to another episode of Artists of the Night. Today I am joined by Ms. Darla Slee. Uh, Darla is a visual artist, a very accomplished visual artist. Uh, her pieces are display a wide range of emotions, I think, uh, as you will see. Um, and we'll, we're going to take this opportunity to kind of just chat with Darla, uh, ask her about her work, ask her about her, uh, her background, and just uh, get to know her a little bit as an artist. So, Darla, how are you today? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for asking. Um, so, Darla, how how did you get in, how did you get involved in art? It seems like a maybe kind of a broad and crazy question. Um, has it been a lifelong passion? It has been a lifelong passion. I can't um, remember the exact age I was, but I um, my mom is also an artist, but uh, she was showing me how to make things out of construction paper and. Um, showed me a, a little bit about drawing, so I started drawing animals in clothes, which I, I seem to enjoy. Um, I think a lot of kids do, and uh, yeah, I kept going. I was always drawing, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I would sit in front of the TV and draw the cartoons I saw, and, um, and then stopped for a while. I sort of went down other creative avenues. I uh, became a jeweler for a while uh, before I realized that I wasn't super passionate about that. Um, I mean, I, I enjoyed the technique, I enjoyed using my hands, but um, the medium just wasn't working out for me. And then I worked on airplanes and felt like I was still missing something. So I started taking drawing classes and um, yeah, once, once I f gained some confidence, uh, felt good about what I was doing. I started showing it to people, and and that's what I've been doing for the past few years, and it's it seems to be working out for me. <laughs> well, that's that's excellent. So, um, so, do you, are you formally trained, or is it you know? I guess you, you mentioned that you've taken classes. Um, yes, I've I've taken a few uh, drawing classes. Um, figure drawing is always very important, but mostly I'm self-taught. Um, I, I would say I, I didn't go, uh, I didn't get a degree. I thought about it. Um, I've asked other artists, you know, is getting a degree in studio arts, is that worth it? Getting a master's or whatnot. I, uh, from what I understand, you get a master's if you want to teach or work in a museum. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of artists just sort of shrugged at me and they said, well, yeah, I don't know if it was really worth it so I, I i think i still struggle with that like should i go get a degree should i not but um you know i i mean at a certain point you are teaching yourself what to do you know either through uh maybe sometimes copying other art to figure out how they've done it or drawing what you see uh, you know a lot of you're teaching yourself anyway and um yeah, that's I, it's working out for me. So. Well, no, and, and I agree. I think there's, uh, you know, the, not education is always good. Um, however, I would say with with something like visual arts, it, there's a lot that is is very is very personal, and it's very it's not something that you're necessarily going to learn in a kind of formalized educational system, uh, you know, sort of environment. It's something that you are, you know, as long as you love it and you're passionate about it and you're spending time on it, then you know that. That time and experience and making mistakes will always be a an excellent teacher right and i i think um there's something to be said for people who teach themselves they are finding their own avenues they're not they're not getting too much influence by someone who's telling them hey do this i mean sometimes that can be good to have someone get you out of your comfort zone and trying something new but uh if you are exploring your own avenues, you might tap into something that's um, unusual, that's new, uh, and I, I think that's that's important. I'd like to maybe hear your thoughts on your piece of work entitled Ymir. Ymir, okay. So I ended up uh, getting very into Norse mythology. It was something that I always wanted to learn more about because in high school they kept teaching us about Greek mythology and you know read the Odyssey and the Iliad and, and I understand the usefulness because it has uh, 
influenced our society and literature so much, but um, I wasn't especially a fan. Um, I think I'm more of a fan now, but I, you know, it's it's like when somebody makes you do something, you never like it as much as when you discover it on your own. But um, uh, you know, I heard about Norse mythology and I wanted to know more about that. Uh, and finally, these last uh, few years, I did start learning more about it. I think um, I think I was listening to a podcast and um, uh, the uh, n narrator read a few uh, stories from Norse mythology and I thought, oh, I, I enjoy these. So I looked into it and figured out what the sources are, um, which we don't actually have many sources because um, Norse mythology was actually written down by Christians about 200 years after the last the last Vikings or Scandinavians had been converted to Christianity. So, and I mean, it had been the, the myths had been passed on through word of mouth before then uh, in oral tradition, and um, sometimes the stories were carved uh, in wood or on rune stones, but. Um, you know, what we have was written down by uh, Christian scholars. So we don't, it's it's obvious, obvious that we're missing a lot of it. And also some of the tales were probably influenced by Christianity. So it may, they may not even be in their original form. Uh, it started, it has begun to influence my work. Um, Ymir is uh, one of those pieces that I was, that, uh, uh, in which Norse mythology influenced me. Um, the story of Ymir is Ymir was this um, this ice this ice giant, and uh, Odin and some of the other characters that were around um, decided they needed to make uh, make the world make Mid Midgard. So they killed Ymir and <laughs> used uh, used his skull as the uh, his skull is the sky his brains are the clouds his blood is the sea um, his bones are the hills and rocks and I I just I just thought that was such fun imagery eventually I would like to do a whole Norse mythology show like do my do a sort of version that uh, also brings in um, the Colorado landscape and maybe even uh, some sort of hobo lore. So we'll, we'll see, we'll see where that goes. But. That sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see that. Looking at your art and I've, I've had, uh, had the, the good fortune of, of seeing your art previous to this. Um, yeah, yeah, you definitely, you, you go into some very interesting corners and you go into some very interesting um, kind of avenues that, which, you know, I, I always personally find intriguing. Um, you know, I think that there is a lot of, I see whimsy in a lot of your work and I see there is kind of this, uh, there's kind of a darkness in, in some of it as well, um, that I think is really, is also very interesting. Um, you know, without giving away too many secrets, um, do you, do you want to maybe kind of speak to, to that and that kind of those influences and those, um, kind of how that comes out into your, in your visual representations? Well, I, I think it goes back to certain things that I've always been attracted to. Um, I, I grew up um, not entirely isolated, but my parents had, um, I guess, a different idea of how to raise kids. So, um, you know, for a bit of my childhood, I wasn't really around other kids and kind of in my imagination, uh, you know, my parents read me the Brothers Grimm tales and um, you know, I watched cartoons, but not too much. We were outside a lot. And, uh, so definitely, I definitely love, uh, fairy tales and folklore and these sorts of things. And for whatever reason, I've always been drawn to spooky, creepy things too. Um, you know, maybe more so as I, as I became an adolescent and, you know, was able to tap into that more on my own, but um, I, uh, well, I think because folklore, you know, a lot of that comes from people 
not understanding how the world works or uh, being creeped out in a forest or whatnot, I think maybe those those things sort of tie together with the, you know, these unsettling feelings that you have and you can't really understand why, like why um, are creepy staircases in the dark, uh, <laughs> I mean, squeaky staircases in the dark, why does that creep you out? And it's, it could be a primal thing, but um, you know, whether you believe in ghosts or not, um, I'm not saying I do, but you, you, uh, there are these things that kind of uh, maybe bother you or excite you or interest you. And, and uh, anyway, I like to tap into that. I like to uh, learn about folklore. I like to learn about history. Um, uh, yeah, I listen to a lot of podcasts about uh, on these topics and, and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say I'd say that's that's a lot of it. Do you want to talk about uh, your piece, Carl Sagan, a little bit? So, Carl Sagan was from a body of work I did. It was a not a traditional tarot deck. It was a traditional tarot deck as a typically I think seventy eight cards, um, and uh, I. Uh, my, my, my sense of humor, sometimes my sense of humor leaks into my work, but um, I was uh, learning more about scientific skepticism and I thought, wouldn't it be fun to make a tarot deck that also sort of promotes skepticism or maybe gets people thinking about that. Uh, so of course, one of the cards is going to be Carl Sagan, uh, the <laughs> astronomer and uh, proponent of critical thinking science educator you know he's left the fantastic legacy and helped people to um uh appreciate uh, science you know its usefulness and um and he had a he put together this baloney detection kit of uh I, and i can't remember all of the elements of that uh, right now but um just to help people when when you come to a new idea or something you know just to just to analyze and think about you know uh is is there evidence to support this um you know what are the facts what how can i how can we uh, figure out if this is this is true or not um you know one of one of these things is occam's razor it's this um uh technique that can be applied to uh, something where the the simplest explanation is often the true explanation. If you uh, <laughs> if you have to explain why the Earth is flat, and you have all these YouTube videos with these complicated you know conspiracy theories and penguins at the edge of the world, I don't, you know at the circumference. I don't know. This is why nobody owns Antarctica anyway. But if it gets too complicated, it's probably not true. And there's another aspect of that too of, of misinformation where um, mm -hmm. people will be given misinformation and accept it as fact without questioning it or you know because that that is part of part of the, you know, the baloney detectors you should question anything you're told and yeah, <laughs> yeah. and, and if, it, if it checks out then it checks out if it doesn't it doesn't sure and it's um skepticism it's not you you shouldn't just dismiss things out of hand uh that's not that's not what it's about and, you know you're presented with something oh that sounds hokey so i'm not even going to pay attention but the but you know what we should do is uh say okay well here's a new idea what's the evidence to support it what uh, what do the experts have to say about it what's you know what's the history or the data i mean you know look at uh Look at all the facts as much as, as as many as you can get and and go from there so you did mention um grimm's fairy tales uh and cartoons as as things that have influenced you Do you have other um other artists or other um other things that have kind of kind of helped you along the way or kind of influenced you as, as far as your visual art goes oh uh, well I definitely um, am a fan of artists from the golden age of illustration, uh, starting in the late 1800s to mm, 
1920s or so era. Um, and I mean, you know, it's illustration has never stopped, but uh, you know, that was a time where artists were creating pieces that could uh, stand on their own, that could be, um, you know, shown in a gallery and purchased. I think a lot of illustration, even even now sometimes we'll just sort of illustrate a, a maybe a few sentences in a story and it helps move the story along but these were pieces that were just um, breathtaking on their own you didn't have necessarily have to know the story maybe uh, maybe if you just saw it and didn't know what was going on you might imagine a story yourself and I, I really enjoy that but um I really like uh, really like the artist Ivan Bilibin he was a Russian illustrator, um, illustrated uh, books and did uh, help, did posters for things, flyers, you know, as you do. Um, helps illustrate uh, or paint scenery and backdrops for plays, uh, which is um, a lot of illustrators, at least back in the day, would, would do that where they would work on uh, stage backdrops and, and props and these sorts of things. Um, I really like uh, Kay Nielsen, another illustrator, sort of from that time period. I'm also a fan of ephemeral art. You know, people who make make these these scenes out of leaves and rocks, and you know, I mean, and again, if you take a photograph of it, then you can see it again. But it's it doesn't last; it goes away. I mean, I don't know. There's just so much, so many cool things that people do. So much creativity in the world. And, I'd like to hear your thoughts on uh, Manitou Springs uh, legend uh, Charles Rocky. Well, um, yeah, as as a child, um, my uh, my mom was into health food. Uh, <laughs> one of the one of the sort of early health food nuts. So we, um, you know, there weren't many restaurants we went to, but we did go to Adams Mountain Cafe. That was uh, when it was uh, in in Manitou off the main drag, and it was up on the hill where uh, where the Mona Lisa fondue restaurant is now, if that's still there. But um, yeah, as a kid, we'd go there and I'd see Rocky's work. I'd see his trolls and fairies and little things. And, and I loved it, you know, I mean, that inspired me. And then we'd go for a walk around Manitou and we'd walk by his studio that had the, the little village in the window and the bed frame. And I mean, that's, yeah, I just I ate that stuff up. <laughs> It's, um, I, I think, you know, that's, that's what I wanted to do when I grew up was, well, or even then, just make little places you could uh, crawl inside of. <laughs> well, I'm sure that, I'm sure that uh, he would have been very happy to hear that and uh, happy, happy with what you've done uh, with that inspiration. I'd like to hear your thoughts on your piece entitled Laika. Laika. Uh, so that was... Leica was from a series I did of uh, animals and clothes because I, yeah, again, I've always enjoyed animals and clothes for some reason. I think a lot of kids do. Um, you know, grew up with um, uh, Beatrix Potter stories, you know, these little hedgehogs with little caps on doing laundry and whatnot. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I had to do, I had to do a series of animals and clothes and, um, Laika was inspired by the the dog Laika, the the uh, stray that they found that um, the Russian uh, rocket scientist found uh, found a stray and named her Laika. Um, they actually uh, promoted her, promoted images of her. She was going to um, you know because they were getting her ready to go into space uh, so that they could learn about um, you know how how animals will be affected um you know before they send humans of course and it's it's a sad story uh because um i mean they were sort of trying to turn her into this this hero and uh one of the scientists who was getting ready to launch her into space um, he brought her home for his kids to play with you know the day before they sent her up um, and uh, she was a very cute little dog, if, you ever, if you've ever seen images. But um, anyway, they got her ready. They had this little sort of box, so she didn't have much room, but this little 
box for her and uh, put her in to send her up. And I guess the new uh, information that was released, I think for a lot, for a long time, they said uh, that she orbited and they ended up feeding her a cyanide capsule and that's how she died. But it's, I guess what really happened was she died maybe almost immediately from overheating when they shot her up. Um, she just wasn't properly protected, overheated and died. And uh, the scientist, you know, one of the scientists on the, uh, who worked on it said, you know, it's tragic because um, her death wasn't justified. They just didn't learn enough from the experiment um, for, yeah, for what they did. And uh, I mean, I understand why people would use animals, use monkeys and, and other creatures in space, maybe before sending humans. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, there's been some tragedy because of it. But anyway, I thought, uh, I thought it would be fun to pay homage to her, just a fun little a sort of space oddity scene where she's looking down at Earth and, you know, just a, a dog in space. I do know that you put out a lot of work. You do you do work a lot. Um, you're pretty consistent. Uh, do you do you hit roadblocks? Do you hit? Uh, are there points in time where, you know, I guess what, what's kind of your take on that? Do you do you kind of roll with that and stop working, or do you try to work through it, or or do you not experience it at all? Um, I think because I take in so many bits of media and, you know, reading books or listening to podcasts or whatnot. Um, I'm constantly filling the well and um, feeling, you know, having inspiration for new things and a lot of, a lot more things I want to do. So I guess uh, in the traditional sort of artist block, I don't know if I've hit that yet, but um, the one thing that has taken its toll on me is, of course, this year, every, just all of the things that have happened this year, the uh, made it very difficult for me to work the pandemic and then you know thinking about police brutality and it's you know having these reading the news and having these things in my mind and like you know what what do i do with that i'm not gonna you know i'm not gonna maybe some people would draw police uh <laughs> doing you know uh, abusing their power but that's not that's not really what I do. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to, yeah, work through that. And uh, I think I think we're all experiencing a lot of uh, anxiety right now, trying to adjust to these uh, just unprecedented circumstances. Um, I think, well, once, now that fall has begun and uh, the, you know, the days are getting cooler and whatnot, that, that has helped me. I just, um, I, I thrive in the cool season, the cooler, darker season. Um, so that's that's helped me. But um, over the summer, I, I had a terrible time trying to create. So I, th I think that would be um, the main roadblock for me. But if I, at least for me, if um, if you are having a rough time, you've uh, hit some sort of block. If you can just try to sit down and keep doing something even if it's even if you think what you're putting out is terrible you know <laughs> um i think it helps to keep going and just uh yeah just just try to keep doing something maybe even take a break from the news and watch star trek or something you know try <laughs> try and feel inspired again go for go for a walk but uh um yeah it's been a it's been a weird year. <laughs> yeah, that's def definitely true. <laughs> I'd like to maybe hear uh, Darla hear you talk about uh, Hell's Domain. Hell's Domain again, um, inspired by Norse mythology. Um, I yeah, I thought it, this was a really fun piece for me to do, uh, just because I you know <laughs> back in my in my youth. Uh, I fancied myself a goth, so uh, when I learned about hell, it was like, well, this is sort of the goth queen. She lives in this gloomy place, you know, her, uh, <laughs> she has a, what is it? 
think her bowl is called famine and you know her bed is called sick bed and uh and she's uh the one half of her is a young uh beautiful maiden as it were and the other half of her is a uh, dead corpse-like decaying there are different interpretations but i i did sort of a, something that's like a corpse on the uh, on the other half and then uh, she's in this this cool uh, domain where the dead come to her um i think the misconception is that uh, people think of hell as sort of like this the christian hell where uh, you know if you're bad you go there but really it was it was a place where just any dead person would go um it was a uh, People think of Valhalla with Norse mythology, but that was a that was Odin um, selected certain people from the battlefield to come to Valhalla. His Ein Hiriar, and uh, it wasn't you know it's not ev not everyone went there. That was actually um, I believe Freya would also select people to go to her. So there's some speculation that you know maybe maybe people would go to different gods, uh, you know, in, in this in this idea of the mythology, people would go to different gods once they died. But um, yeah, a lot of people would just go down to Hill's domain and she would uh, take care of the, take care of the, her little dead people. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily a punishment then. It was just more of that, that was where you're, you know, after, after you have escaped this mortal coil, then you know, you, and, you know, maybe even with the, the model you were talking about, there, depending on the DD, you would go into a, a different domain, um, depending on which. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, this concept of punishment after death seems to be a Christian concept. Um, so yeah, not a lot of societies really uh, held with that. You know, it's just a you die and it's sort of a transformation you go somewhere else but there was a there was a this uh corpse ripper nidhog this creature that would munch on corpses so i don't know i th think i read that there was some speculation that maybe even that was a christian influence of or of uh, yeah the punishment for your sins after death uh possibly not i don't know but uh yeah so there there is that's why i have the monster in the background eating eating a corpse because that's part of it this fun weird world <laughs> <laughs> awesome um, do you have advice for maybe some like a young person who is uh interested or has a passion for art and, and maybe just wants you know and maybe is in a similar situation that, that you've been in where you just are kind of this is, this is what you want to do and and i mean do you have do you have any 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 possible guidance or, or words of wisdom for for someone in that situation um if you feel that uh it's it's something that speaks to you that you want to do that's pulling towards you uh don't give up um you know a class in the basics will help uh i don't know i don't know if classes beyond that are good or not again figure drawings always useful but also draw what you see um because that's that's the best way to teach yourself but um yeah i don't don't worry about what people say or think if it, uh, you know, if you're getting the sense from people that they don't take it seriously or you should get a job as a lawyer because that's going to pay the bills. And maybe sometimes, yeah, maybe sometimes that is a, a good choice for you, um, you know, but <laughs> um, just if, if, if it calls to you, do it and put your work out there even if even if you have doubts about it uh which I, I don't think i'll ever stop having doubts about my work you know i think that's a that's something that all artists deal with but if you have doubts about it just put it out there because you you never know what sort of response you'll get and um and i i think uh you know that's that's fulfillment in a way you, you know, watching people enjoy your art or look at it um yeah I, I think that's good and the the longer you do it the better you'll get you know even if even if you start off and you're you're not great at least by your standards or, or whatever you know there aren't 
necessarily standards, but um, you know, the longer you do it, the, the better you get at it. I've seen people who, uh, you know, started drawing and it looked, um, yeah, it looked the way it does when people start drawing, but uh, just, you know, a year or two later, they were just doing this incredible work. I mean, it doesn't take long, you know, if you, if you keep doing it and work at it. Um, so I, yeah, and say, don't, don't worry, just make it and, and show it to people. <laughs> so um, I would have one more I'd like to ask you about. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about Cactus, Cactus Cat. Uh, Cactus Cat was um, just, yeah, a, a fun, whimsical piece to, for me. I, I couldn't say uh, anything specific influenced influenced me. Sometimes ideas just come to me. There was um, a call for artists for uh, pieces that were 12 by 12. And I saw a Red Baron pizza box and uh, realized those were the exact measurements. So I ended up turning it inside out and creating this three-dimensional cat who's a kind of she looks kind of surly and tough out there being a farmer in the desert <laughs> tough but, tough yeah job. Yeah, yeah you gotta be you gotta be a, a tough cat <laughs> <laughs> um i it was just it was just a fun piece for me uh it's actually one of the first three-dimensional pieces i did um because uh, yeah, I, I that's the other thing I, I make um, a lot of my work is three dimensional. It's an element I didn't really I haven't seen too many other people doing it. There are other artists out there, of course, that make three dimensional work, but um, uh, yeah, I haven't seen many. And once uh, once I thought about oh, that's something I can do, it, I just uh, I ran with it, and it, I'm still. Uh, developing the technique I want to make it better but right now I've got a pretty good pretty good method I think um, but yeah cactus cat was one of my one of the original three-dimensional pieces so she's she's a lot of fun and those uh, those three-dimensional pieces that you do are no, I, I I agree I think it's, it's pretty uncommon it's almost like a flattened diorama or something in, in a way where you are kind of layering you know you're, you're kind of, it's not it's not like a full you know, vol full volume, but it is definitely has a three-dimensional element and, and still kind of retains a very like two-dimensional um, kind of viewpoint. Yeah, um, it's I don't, and it's one of those uh, things. I, I don't know why. I just I think it's fun to look into something and almost feel like you can step into this little box. Um, yeah, it's a a personal thing. <laughs> But uh, other people seem to enjoy it, so it's working. Well, Darla, um, thank you so much for talking to me today. Um, and I'm uh, going to go ahead and provide links uh, to Darla's uh, social media if you would like to take some more time and kind of uh, explore her impressive uh, body of work. Uh, again, Darla, thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking to you today. It was great talking to you, and this was fun. Well, then uh, I will see you later, and I hope you all have enjoyed uh, Artist of the Night with Darla Slee. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> all right.